Thank you very much, Uriya uh, Ajay, for that background. Now to uh, discuss this subject matter, we have guests with us here in the studios as well as at uh, our other network centers. With us in Abuja, let's welcome Mahmoud Yusuf, is a legal practitioner and programs manager at Network of University Legal Aid Institutions. Uh, Mr. Mahmoud Yusuf, pleasure to have you this morning. Thank you very much. Also here with us is uh, Ruth Olofin, Olofin is Acting Executive Director of Kling Foundation. Uh, pleasure to have you with us, uh, Thank Ms. Thank you, Olofin. good morning. Yes. And joining us from our Kaduna studio is uh, former Chief Judge of the FCT, uh, Justice Ishak Bello, is also the Chairman of the Presidential Committee on Corrections, Reforms, and Decongestion. Uh, Justice Bello, thank you very much for joining us. Also from our Joe's studio, we have, we have been joined by Dr. Guleng Daskes, and he's a criminologist and lecturer Department of Sociology, University of Joe's. Uh, Dr. Daskes, thank you very much for joining us on the program. All right, uh, it looks like we're having some audio issues there from uh, the two network centers. But if uh, those issues have been cleared up, we'll just uh, like to start the conversation uh, from our guests you know, who are outside, especially uh, from the Just Network Center, uh, where Dr. Daskes is. All right, uh, Dr. Gulen Daskes, uh, thank you once again for being our guest this morning. Now, we understand that uh, you had, of course, done some study on the correctional facilities or prisons as we used to know them in and around Joss area. And now this being the latest of uh, the attacks that we have uh, witnessed on, on prison facilities around the country, could you just indicate uh, to our viewers uh, what what happened and what might have gone wrong? We're hanging up. Let's come back to our, our studios here and then uh, get uh, uh, to speak to uh, the acting executive director of, of Clean uh, Foundation, uh, Ms. Ruth uh, Olofin. Ms. Ruth Olofin. So this is an incident that uh, we've, we've witnessed, uh, let's say, almost every quarter of the year. We've had four of them, uh, and uh, usually fatalities, and of course, destruction of uh, a government uh, uh, facility. What is happening to our correctional facilities that make them so vulnerable? Okay, thank you so much uh, for having me. Um, it's interesting that um, these attacks are beginning to happen in quick succession. And like you rightly noted, about four has been recorded. And in the month of um, October, we recorded two um, already. What it means is that this is a concern, you know, that we need to begin to address. Um, on the face of it, you need to address this on two, look at it from two angles, the external angle and also the internal issues. If we take it from the angle of the internal issues, that the well-known issues that we've always known that our correctional facilities are, are sort of inadequate to the holding capacity is very, very low. Uh, for instance, we're also told that the, the facility in Oyo State, for instance, the capacity is for 160 inmates, but currently houses about 800. That of Port Harcourt is supposed to house 800 and is currently housing about 4,000. So clearly, the space is very limited and then there are other issues in terms of when you move around these correctional <laughs> facilities, you will see that some of these facilities are old structures. And then the security, you know, um, equipment or architecture around those facilities are a bit outdated. You know, one of the things you need to see how you can evolve with the times. Because if you're continually having, you know, people being pumped into those facilities, you need to also upgrade, you know, the system and upgrade the security architecture that you have. That is a bit on the internal side, we can come back to it. Externally, again, and very critically, is the issue of the proliferation of small arms and light weapons. Again, because you see that 
I was just telling my colleague now that, you know, these are becoming coordinated, and then you have external influence coming in. So gunmen attacking, bandits or whatever attacking this facility. It means that there's access, you know, to small arms, freely flowing, and people can just pick these arms and just go and attack, you know, this facility. And you need to also look at the quality of the arms and ammunition that the prison guards are having. If you are faced with superior ammunition coming from outside, tendency is that, yes, lives will be lost, you are going to bow to pressure. So these are some of the systematic issues that you need to take on board. Look at it from an external point of view. And try to also understand who are these people that are doing this from the external side. I think I'll cap it at that and come back. Okay, let's, let's bring uh, Mahmoud Yusuf. Uh, from what she has said, if, if you look at three prong areas, um, the frequency of attacks on our correctional centers. And then you look at um, the sophistication of, you know, the weapons used. And then you also look at, you know, the, the, the coordination, you know, with which these attacks are carried out. What are you bridging? Do you, are we dealing with widening security issues? Okay, um, as she rightly pointed out, um, you look at it from the angle of um, the internal and the external factors. First, you mentioned about the sophistication, the kind of sophistication around uh, uh, the weapons that they're, they're, they're bringing about. Yes, we have issues around kidnapping, banditry, and what have you prevalent now, which is as a result of uh, the proliferation of small arms mm -hmm. and ammunition. Um, most of the time, I would uh, look at it from the perspective <coughs> of an access, access to justice perspective uh, to the fact that these people that are being kept in custody are there not on their own uh, uh, volition. So what are the reasons behind them being there? So you see people who are charged with capital offenses, uh, treason, you see people charged with kidnapping, murder, and they're there for 15 years. Most of them have not gone to court. So these uh, centers that are built to house convicts, in most cases, you see, uh, like uh, given the example of Joss, you have a, it's, it has a capacity of between, I think, um, 400 to 500, but it houses, uh, it houses about 1,060 or above currently. And most of the, in, uh, the, the, the inmates there are awaiting trial. So the coordination comes from the fact that you have people who are, you have syndicates, you have, uh, you have uh, people who are, uh, are connected to these people maybe, and they are outside. So it, it, it's born out of some frustration and then also the fact that the system is uh, built against them, these awaiting trial persons. So I, I believe if, 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 I am, if, if a person is convicted and rightly put in, in, into custody, they would not have this, uh, this issue of, uh, of agitation. And you mentioned one or the, the <coughs> last. Uh, the la yes, I, I, I talked about one, the coordination. I talked mm. about the frequency, and mm. I talked about the sophistication of weapons mm. used. Uh, if, uh, and, and I'd like us to look at it from the external first, because uh, the inmates are inside, you know, uh, uh, of course, they're uh, secluded. The attacks are coming from the outside. And what we are saying is, what is the pool for these attacks? Is S it a security situation? Or is it a, a, a desire to free in, in inmates or what? I, I don't know. Well, uh, uh, to your point, it, it's also um, a link to the security situation where you have issues around banditry and kidnapping. These are all prevalent issues. And like I said, it boils down to access to justice issues where you get, uh, where you just round up people and you incarcerate them. I'll give example, the, uh, the recent, um, uh, just uh, recently, a few days ago in um, Akwa the, the, the High Court in Akwaibom discharged about 14 uh, detainees who were awaiting trial for, for treason. For 15 years, they were kept in custody and they were discharged because there was no evidence to support a conviction. 
So these are all systematic issues that it's, like I said, it frustrates people. Then the coordination comes around. We know that crime is not, it's not, uh, it's not doing, done in isolation. You usually have groups, like the kidnappings we have. You have the, kid, uh, the kingpings, and they have the, the sophistry with which they have uh, the, the weapons they use. Then also you mentioned the issue of security. Yes, security is a, is a major issue where you have the free flow of arms, uh, small arms and ammunition. Everybody can go anywhere and get, and get this thing. So it's a major, major, major thing that needs, needs to, be, to, be, to be looked into. Hmm. Mm. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Mahmoud Yusuf, for your uh, initial points. Let's uh, go over to our Kaduna Network Center now. Now, we, we understand that the uh, lines have been cleared up, and so uh, we we'll bring in his uh, lordship, Honorable Justice Ishak Bello, that's the former chief judge of the Federal Capital Territory and uh, chairman of the Presidential Committee on Correctional uh, Reforms and Decongestion. Uh, now, Lord Honorable Justice, uh, of course, you've, you've listened to our background reports and uh, the comments made by the other guests, uh, quite aside from the attacks that we have uh, had uh, on uh, prison facilities this year, we know that there are reports from time to time of jail breaks, uh, fairly common uh, last year as well during the NSAS uh, protest. Do these incidents uh, speak to uh, the mandate of your committee? And uh, how do you respond to these numerous unsavory uh, reports coming out of the correctional services facilities. Thank you very much, Mr. Kingsley. Um, I, I, I'm really surprised that uh, this curiosity has uh, uh, been delayed for quite some time because uh, the issue of jailbreak has been on and uh, it's quite uh, an embarrassment to the nation. Uh, I would say that uh, it's, it, all these things raised are really directly uh, in consonance with the mandate of the Presidential Committee on Decongestion or Reforms of the Correctional Service Centers in the country. The committee was inaugurated on the 30th of July 2017, and between that time and now, we visited over 39 correctional service centers and uh, jail delivery of over 12,000 Inmates, that is within the adult incarceration centers, and um, with the, the juvenile correctional centers, uh, over 150 something uh, discharged for various reasons, which perhaps times may allow for me to allude. Now, I agree with um, the issue of uh, congestion uh, relatively. When I say relatively, here is respect of the type of offenses. If you take, for instance, the issue of uh, kidnap, many people, including the victims or the relations of the victims, hardly would want to go to court to give evidence. Because if you have 10 people in the court at the gallery, you can be rest assured five are members of the suspects. And without insulated provisions, what I'm saying, facilities, to, to, to insulate the witnesses from identification as it obtains in the blood claims, many people shy away from coming to court, even to assert their own rights in that regard. So a judge can go into a court 100 times, the witnesses may not be there because of fear of identification and being harassed chased and perhaps killed. Even the judges hardly have any uh, insulation to such vulnerability. So to that extent, yes, you can find congestion with respect of such offenses. I remember even uh, in the case of murder, which I handled before I left. Over 15 years, I was on that matter to the level of boredom. No judge likes to stay over a matter for a long period of time. He wants to move. The assassination of Harry Marshall. Nobody came. At the end of the day, the matter had to be thrown out on grounds of no case submission. The prosecution did not even oppose. Now that is that aspect. And another element that brings in 
congestion is unprosecutable cases. You know you don't have evidence, but you would rather use the court as scapegoat. You keep on adjourning, 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 adjourning until such a time when they just said enough is enough. Meanwhile, the human rights activists are pressing on the judge to track up the matter at early stage, but because of exhibition of judicial maturity, he keeps on restraining, restraining, until such a time he strikes it out. And the moment he strikes it out, the media will carry. Oh, the police are doing their best to cl cleanse the society of crimes. The, 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 the judiciary is messing up, the, uh, striking and throwing out such cases. Now, coming back to the issue of jailbreak. There are so many issues that we found, we made situational assessment and made reports for necessary action, but those that are concerned have failed and in itself is a factor to generating this kind of thing. Condemned prisoners, those who are on death row, abound across this country in various correctional service centers. We have graphically categorize these condemned prisoners state by state as a committee. What is the purpose? If Mr. A is convicted perhaps in Kaduna State and sentenced to death, for some reasons, the Correctional Service Center has decided to move him to Joss. In the course of our journeying, we meet those kind of persons. We list them for Kaduna State executive to attend, or Kano, or, or your state, or Lagos state, so that it will make it easy for them to see at a glance those that are meant for them to take necessary action. I can tell you, the failure on the part of the governors, I have said it severally, and to some few of them directly, has been making it permissible for more crimes to be committed in Nigeria. Because those outside make reference to those inside, saying after all, nothing is going to happen. And with time, they will start applying for commuter to life imprisonment, and for many other reasons, sometimes they succeed. And these outside who are their foot soldiers are seen. They continue to commit crimes, they educate their own children, they maintain their own families, and when it comes to getting people that will uh, uh, ignite the, 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 the problem so that they can release people from prison. It's an easy thing for them. And I can tell you too, authoritatively, communication between one correctional center to another among inmates is much more effective than between you and me. If you know the number of answers that are there within the various correctional centers, you'll be shocked. It is quite uh, 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 a problem, it's very, very embarrassing. And uh, some of these condemned prisoners have become institutions even within. They can dictate the pace of what does is, is happening. And the target is for them to find a way out. Even if the officers who are always sympathized, looking at the kind of facilities they have, even to defend themselves, uh, 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 do their best to make sure that they cordon the area of the cordo uh, condemned ones. And you find only the awaiting trial, in most cases escaping, but there are a few condemned ones that also manage to escape. And when you have some high profile individuals spread, located at various places, they know this. That is why you have these simultaneous occurrences of jailbreak because they know where some of these persons are located and they will organize and effectively so to launch their attack. So, strangely enough, because the, heads, the headship of various states do not like to act in this manner, they had this kind of conspiracy at the Senate and the National Assembly where they passed, they made a prohibition in the new Correctional Service Act that where a governor neglects, refuses, or decline to endorse warrant for execution of an, a condemned prisoner, a judge or, I mean, the chief judge of the state can reduce to life imprisonment the condemned sentence, which fortifies a statement made to me by one of the 
chief executives as we are going around. That as far as is concerned, the power to sign warrant for execution should be resided in the court, meaning the court now is doing its job, trial, conviction, sentencing, and then sign warrant for execution. Now that has been achieved through a, a legislative act of the National Assembly. This to me is, a, is, is, a, is an outright uh, 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 abandonment of constitutional responsibility. And that is all about checks and balances. That is why the chief executives were uh, 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 conferred with the yes, constitutional... Justice, Justice Bello, thank you. Let's, let's just put you on hold for a moment and get the perspective of uh, Dr. Uh, Dasquez, uh, who is a criminologist and lecturer uh, joining us from uh, studio in Jaws. Uh, Dr. Dasquez, uh, I, I, I'm not really getting the nexus between uh, congestion and the frequency of these attacks because the attacks are not coming from the inside but rather from without and again if you look at the fact that i mean we've had prison congestion has been with us for a long time but we've never had this kind of attacks jail breaks and all that it's only beginning it's only happening you know of of, of recent now We've told, we have been told that you've done uh, a research on the situation in Joe. So let's use that as a test case and find out if there are other reasons why our correctional centers are target of attack. Right. Um, thank you very much. Um, I was actually trying to respond before the network went off. Um, when I was asked about how it happened. Um, incidentally, it happened on Sunday um, around 5.25.30 p.m. And of course, it was actually something that seemed to be a coordinated attack by gunmen who came from outside, like you rightly pointed out. And for me, I think that it is not an attack that just happened within that day, but it's actually a product of um, some kind of um, a prolonged study of the security situation in the facility. Um, some two months ago, there was actually an incident that happened where four inmates escaped. And I thought that that would have been some kind of early warning for the, the, the prison or the correctional facility to be proactive in ensuring that inmates who come in there are secured and of course the facility itself is secured. But with this incident that happened, um, it that clearly shows that there are a lot of other things that um, correctional facilities and of course authorities need to do to um, avert and ensure that the facilities are indeed um, and protected. You know, yeah, um, discussants have actually talked about the fact that the prisons are overcrowded. But I think beyond that, like you said, this is an external attack. And we cannot rule out the, the, the possibility of the interest that criminal networks outside have concerning um, some of their gang members that have been in the prison. And the most important thing is that these inmates that are in the facilities are actually not completely free from the communication they have with their criminal gangs outside. Um, uh, the judge actually mentioned the fact that when they went around prisons, they discovered that the inmates have phones and what do they do with these, these cell phones? They actually establish you know, connection with the gangs they have had before they came into the prison. And the communication actually goes on. And most times, you discover that even issues that have to do key critical security issues are communicated to these gangs outside. And that would have actually facilitated some of these um, um, attacks that, that go on. Uh, within the prison. 
So, so that is indeed very, very important. And of course, it calls for um, um, issues of intelligence that you know, is supposed to be at the forefront, even when it comes to safeguarding our correctional um, facilities. What is the extent to which in intelligence is actually used in determining the category of inmates that we bring in? What is the data base of the inmates that we bring in? And apart from the database, what are the kind of office offenses they have committed? Uh, and these offenses would have actually helped in ensuring that uh, more security you know, is intensified in these facilities uh, um, that we have. Unfortunately, the database may be there, but we don't take advantage of that. And again, um, you know, there is one thing that, that is very common with, with us, and that thing is the idea that once inmates come into a um, correctional facility, they are there, um, of course, to serve punishment, but besides, you know, um, serving punishment, majority, including the staff, believe that these are criminals, and therefore, they don't need to, you know, be close to them. But, but again, coming back to the intelligence that I talked about, it is when you relate with these inmates that you get intelligent information. And I think that, you know, we shouldn't shy away from the fact that, yes, they must have committed offenses, but at the point in time, they were normal human beings before they, they came into um, these facilities. And so, when we establish some kind of a um, um, close relationship with them, we can get information from these inmates, including the communication they established you know, with their criminal gangs outside that would have warranted this kind of um, um, attacks. All right, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daskas, uh, for uh, that, uh, that view. I, uh, I'm just tempted to, uh, well, let's return back to the, the studios here. Uh, uh, Ruth uh, Olofin of Clint, uh, earlier you, uh, you, s you set up the foundation for uh, your comments describing the internal and external uh, factors that, that account for this. But uh, are we also now seeing the audacity of criminal gangs to liberate their kind who are behind bars, uh, as it were? And from the security architecture, how well are we prepared, you know, to fend off uh, these assaults? Thank you very much. Um, so, I don't think, well, I think basically we are taking, still seeing these as isolated cases. Uh, if you look at this from a security point of view, most of these crimes are coordinated, they are organized. And if you begin to look at it from that perspective, you begin to plan towards it. I think that the point that we are now, we haven't taken that recognition into our security planning that the correctional facilities or the agencies have to step up the game. Because if you look at it that this is becoming frequent and there's some kind of external influence, how do you also guard yourself? Such that, and um, Doctor made allusion to the need for intelligence gathering. That has been so, mo is so weak both within the level of the correctional, the judiciary, and also the police. How do you get intelligence? These this attacks don't just happen just on their own. There must have been discussions. And it's, it's amazing that inmates already have you know, cell phones, so there are communications that are ongoing. And again, it brings me to the, the discussion I had when I started this day, that you have to also look at the internal factors. How did these inmates get those handsets? within the facility. Mm -hmm. So is there some kind of collusion on the part of our, of our, of our correctional um, okay. officers? Are they facilitating it? So we need to ask questions. Who are those people manning those guys? Is there um, a kind of political economy to this such that if, you're, if you know you're going to bring in contraband, handsets, I'm also going to get a cut from it. So I think it's to unpack all of these issues and begin to dig deeper what is bringing all of this. If you securitize you know, the jailbreaks that you're having, Tendency is that the state or, or, or the government is going to step up its game in terms of trying to ensure that we man these facilities adequately. And again, 
this contributes to a much larger discussion in terms of the state of insecurity in Nigeria. We have been talking about kidnapping, armed banditry, insurgency, and all of that. But my analysis is that this needs to come back to the, con uh, to the discussion. It needs to be contributed to the entire discussion in terms of how we are handling internal security. Again, jailbreaks are not crimes that happen in isolation. There has to be a connection to it. If you make that connection, you're better placed you know, to respond you know, to the issues. I, I think that we're still trying to see these jailbreaks as isolated cases and as such, are not paying the needed attention that we need to pay to those uh, uh, form or, or, or preventing such um, attacks. And then going forward, how do we you know, um, reform the criminal justice system? A lot has been said, and I'll pick it up from where my colleague uh, from Nulai talked about. The Be access sorry, before you take that uh, criminal justice system, uh, the issue of phone you know, has triggered a question, and I'd like you to help me answer it. Where do we draw a line between a convict's political right and security? That is quite a difficult one. I think that right now, those who are in those facilities do not have the right to go in with such um, handsets. We should prioritize the security force rather than, they are not right, you're not supposed to have. So there's a violation somewhere. At this point, we should be looking at the security of the country or, and, or, and also of the, the, the citizens because if these persons come out, and that is again the fear, some of them are hardened criminals. If they come out into the society, it's also going to put a lot of pressure on what is already happening in country in terms of um, internal security challenges. So I think that the issue of phone should not be discussed here. Rather, we should be looking at what are those issues happening within those centers that are facilitating inmates <coughs> having access to bring in uh, cell phones into those uh, uh, um, um, facilities. It should be about security and, and for me not about um, phone, uh, having access to phones. Yeah. Uh, and again, um, mm. looking at this, if you're going to have access to phone, I think that there are designated phones within those facilities that they can have and at you know, stipulated times. And those discussions have to be monitored. That is the sense that we get. So it's not as if you just come into the prisons and then and you already have, have your phone. It means that there are no control measures to track the discussions that you're having. Yeah. And then when you, how do you get to monitor a charge for your credit? So who says that to you? Who says that? You know, we need to unpack it. There's yeah. quite a lot happening. Yes. So in some kind of illicit business that are happening within the system it, themselves. It, that's why I, I would like us to take advantage one more time of uh, the presence of the former chief judge of the Federal uh, uh, Capital Territory, who, who chairs the, the presidential committee. Uh, my Lord Honorable Justice, are, are Nigerian prisons were wrong against the background of the issues that are being ventilated right now, access to otherwise contraband items and so on and so forth. And uh, from what you have done in terms of your visitation and all that, what have you found the most uh, worrying about uh, the state of our prisons or correctional centers as they are now so-called? There's a lot uh, seen and uh, very worrisome, but uh, I can assure you that uh, a lot of things are also being done to correct and a lot of things have been corrected. This issue of phone is a very important factor in terms of the stability of the correctional service center. I mean, the nation, recently we have seen how state governors uh, ensure that uh, services by uh, all these uh, uh, media houses or whatever you call them, the, the MT8, MTN, Blue, and many other things, communication were destabilized in order to block uh, communication between informants and uh, bandits. Now, if you have this kind of communication within the correctional service centers, you can know that they will always relate to their members outside. And that is to me very, very appalling and disturbing. And uh, unless something is done, this break, jailbreak will continue. I can tell you that when I said at my opening remarks that some of these condemned prisoners have become institution, I know what I'm saying. And I believe talking to people that are enlightened, you understand there are certain things you don't say publicly, but uh, I can tell you that they have become institutions. Sometimes they can dictate 
what they want to be done. That is compromising the system or the institution. And uh, th a lot needs to be done in that direction, very radically to address that. We know as a fact that some of the delays in the disposal of cases are also connected to a deficit in infrastructure regarding the correctional service centers. Because if you, as a judge or magistrate, you want to sit and then there is no vehicle to convey suspect to, the, to, 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 to your court, there's nothing you can do. But to adjourn the matter, this is a, a, a factor that we must understand. Uh, it's a collective responsibility. Uh, I know uh, not quite long the Minister of Interior did purchase vehicles and then uh, also directed uh, advisedly that all uh, exe chief executives should do the need tools in terms of condemned prisoners, meaning admitting by implication the, 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 the chaos, you know, the tension they cause within. Many a times when we get into uh, some of the correctional service centers, knowing that they are condemned prisoners, they will raise hell until we are able to address them, to pacify them, to cool down, before we can even uh, conduct the sessions that led us here, there. So you can understand that it is a very terrible thing. That is why I've been hammering about these condemned prisoners. If you do that, one, you strengthen the law, the potency of the law, because those outside will see that, yes, it is, it is not business as usual as usual, leaving people to be lying there for ages, even after they have exhausted their right of appeal from court of appeal to the Supreme Court. The law would be made more meaningful because you, they have seen the implementation of the law. But after exhaustion of appeal where, where a convict requires he's left there, he's not supposed to be there for one day after he has exhausted his appeal and the, the verdict has been affirmed by the court. There is no why or any reason that person should be let. But the, 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 the passive attitude is rendering the potency of the law to become less, less efficacious in the society and in turn promoting criminality. So this is very, very important. On the part of the correctional, I mean, the, the, the presidential committee, we have made a lot of recommendations and we know, and happily so, that the presidency has always accepted and endorse our recommendations. Let me say this. We looked at those that were able to read from A level, O level up to doctorate within the prisons before their terminal date. And we asked the question, and I know the number of times I had uh, legislators as to what will happen to their credentials at the end of the day to address recidivism. And luckily, it was assented that those that were able to acquire learning, once they are out, the control general, as by law, is empowered to recommend amnesty for them. So that when they are feeling any form, the column there, wherever convicted, will, is meaningless to them. It's not applicable to them. They are as clean as a newly born baby. And those that could not acquire learning, we made the advocacy, and it's within the law, as provided. Those who are able to acquire skills, in terms of carpentry, other trades, they are also entitled to such, to remedy recidivism. It was idleness that was leading them into crime. Now they are given the opportunity to be reintegrated into the society and feel free to work anywhere like any other person. Now, these areas are very, very fundamental and crucial in terms of reducing the population in the prison and then relapsing back into, into, into crime our only concern now is uh, how people will understand the need to even volunteer information when there is need to testify against any person standing trial. Because it's not, the, it's not for the Correctional Service Center to gather information or intelligence information alone. They cannot do it alone. Because if the prosecution has not completed its investigation, the hostile cases are there which they are just in custody, and when there is attack, it is at their own domain. Let me talk, quickly talk about the lack of understanding the nexus between what I earlier said and the external uh, attack. You have had people hiding themselves and in a way raising alarm that they were kidnapped. Is that an external uh, uh, factor? It was engineered from within. Even if somebody made the alarm, he was just doing it in sequence. I mean, 
consequential to what he was told by that person who had hidden himself and said he was kidnapped just for him to conspire and get a fund to share with the person that would take, tell the story. Now, what I was saying is that a lot of these things are engineered by those condemned prisoners from within. And the attack, of course, has to be from outside. But the ignition point is within. And I hope my sister over there will now see the nexus from what I had said earlier on regarding external, external factor. And the earlier something is done on this, the, the, I have seen this thing face to face. I went around and I saw the just the situation there, and that's why I'm hammering on this. It's, it's an ignition point. It has to be addressed, and then many things will fall in place. I, I, I really do agree with you that uh, there is need to decongest the prisons. Of course, if the prisons are decongested, those on death row for quite a long time, uh, either, you know, uh, given their punishment or set free, and we have greater room, there wouldn't be the attraction for the external forces to go to attack the prison because we have nobody there to attack. I agree with you, there's need to decongest. But maybe in the course of our program, we will look at you know, the impact of decongesting our prisons and how it will affect you know, the security. Let me come to Mahmoud and back to the incident that happened in Jos on Sunday. And the story coming out from Jos is that the, the attackers came in large numbers. And the scenario, the picture that runs in my head is, okay, if they, if they were attacked in large numbers and there were other sister you know, military formations around the correctional center, so they, they all came you know, in one swoop or in different directions, they had sophisticated weapons. Were those weapons concealed in, in what were? And they swooped straight to the, you know, to the gate of the correctional center. And our correctional officers were there, were they sleeping? Does that not speak to the alertness and intelligence and preparedness of even our correctional centers to be able to detect? If these people came in large numbers, walked towards you with guns, I mean, you should, you should, I, 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 don't, I don't know. <laughs> well, uh, uh, I wouldn't have, um much to see, but I'll give perspective to that because the uh, the story is still evol evolving. We don't really know what actually happened and how they actually got there. And uh, I'll say again, and, and I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll align to uh, what Dr. Gulen. Uh, Des uh, uh, mm -hmm. Gulen, uh, Gulen said, this appears to be a coordinated attack. And lending voice to the fact that it is not something that those people outside, the, it's people that have an idea about what the, situa the security situation is. So if you go to the custodial uh, centers, for instance, you'll find out that you just see about two or three armed, squad, uh, armed personnel, except, of course, for Kuje, where mm. I know they have a, a military... Um, a military presence, presence yeah. a, a heavy military uh, presence there. So that speaks to the fact that we really need to look at the security situation. Uh, the, the, the just prisons is located uh, in, uh, in, in a, I would say, a heavily uh, secure, secure area so to speak. because you have the police, uh, the police command, you have a police barrack just adjacent to, um, uh, to that. So, um, we can't see how these people got there, but it speaks to the preparedness of the custodial uh, uh, centers. Uh, okay. So if you have this number of, um, of, of, of inmates, about uh, uh, over 1,000 inmates, and it's a, it's a maximum security um, uh, center, and you have just about three, uh, three armed, mm -hmm. armed, armed squad uh, personnel, you definitely know that if attackers come and they have superior powers so because that's the that's the story that has been going on they came with superior powers sophisticated weapons and then compared to what the uh, the custodial centers uh, ha uh, have not shying from the fact that yes there's institutional problems that needs to be addressed mm -hmm. with the uh, the staffing of the, the staffing and the training of this course, uh, correctional. So it's not enough <laughs> for you to give a, a, cor uh, a correctional uh, officer a gun and say, guard this very massive facility. 
it it has to be something that we look at it from the institutional perspective look at it from the training perspective and see how like most of the uh, panelists have said this is something that is coming from within how fish because if you if we thoroughly investigate we'll see there's connivance from some of the it's it's unfortunate and regrettable but there is connivance from there is people a mole within yes there from, is, there uh, could from be people a mole. within <laughs> Be, uh, mostly from people who come visiting and the the, the the case the area and see oh this person is doing this at this time this person is doing this at this time or when they go for the um they are caught they appearances are caught. because that is also an opportunity for them to interact with uh, with with their uh, with their with their accomplices who are outside and at large. Mm -hmm. So we really need to look at the security, not just with the the, the, the correctional facilities, but the security architecture mm -hmm. and the security arrangement as a whole. The state governments get you don't know what they get as security votes. These things are security issues. What are they doing to support these institutions? So this is a conversation that w should not just be focused on the, uh, the, the corrections, but expanded to other security agencies. Thankfully, when they made the, uh, when, when they made the plea, when they made a distress call, you had other si uh, sister agency come to, um, uh, to, to support them and they were able to contain the situation. But by then, the damage has already mm -hmm. been done. Yeah. All right, uh, Mahmoud uh, Yusuf, thank you very much there for uh, your views. Uh, uh, lady and gentlemen, we're going to have to take a short break now. When we return, we'll continue with the conversation that is the black swan of the century has actually hit the whole world very hard, even the strongest of economies. And Nigeria was not spared. But due to the proactive stance and steps that the president has taken, we've been able to come out quickly. The president has consistently said we must invest in infrastructure. Even as we're investing in human capital, that we must invest in infrastructure. Because at the end of the day, that is what will bring about a sustainable economic growth. So the president has uh, given us our directive. He has said you must make sure you pay salaries and pay pensions, but you also make sure that the critical projects of roads, railway, airports, bridges, major infrastructure that are meant to drive the growth of the economy, that we consistently invest in them, even if we have to continue to borrow to do so. This message is from the Federal Minister of Information and Culture. Finally, the hero of Nigeria's democracy has arrived. He shall usher us into a new phase of development, peace, and prosperity. He is the father of the new Nigeria. His Excellency, President Muhammadu Buhari, GCFR. Welcome to another season of Giving Nigerians Hope yet again. We are sure of a great future for both ourselves and generations yet unborn. We look forward to your leading us as a nation into our manifest destiny. Though the challenges against us as a people are many, we know that your leadership shall set us on the right path to our greatness. A new dawn beckons on us all, and having you as our president is a precursor to this. Thank you for believing in Nigeria. This message is from the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA. Against all odds, we shall and must remain united. We may have our challenges, our problems, and setbacks. However, together, we shall overcome them all. What doesn't break us shall make us stronger. This is the mindset that shall bring peace, progress, and prosperity to our beloved country. Do not let tribal and religious sentiments govern how you think, act, or feel. Don't be influenced by those who want to destroy our precious national unity. Everybody who is Nigerian is your brother and your sister. This is the mindset of the new Nigeria. It is also the mindset that we must all adopt. Let us support each other in creating the Nigeria of our dreams. This message is from the Nigerian Television Authority, NTA.
Welcome back. Uh, you're still watching Good Morning Nigeria live on the network service of the Nigerian Television Authority. We still have all our four guests uh, in Kaduna, Joss, and two here with us in the Abuja studios. Let's return to Joss, uh, Dr. Gulang uh, Gaskins. Uh, let, let's uh, take a look at one or two uh, issues that uh, have been raised. One, what do we know at this time? Uh, about the attackers, some of whom were earlier reported to have been trapped uh, within the prisons. Uh, are they now amongst the escapees? That's one. And two, from your general study, why does it appear that the sister security agencies still largely operate as uh, silos? In other words, each one is different. Uh, I mean, if there, were pro if there was prior intelligence Operationable or actionable intelligence, then the uh, prison officers should, should have been on uh, a higher alert. Uh, and once gunshots were already sounding at that time of day, uh, of course, you would expect others with their antenna to be up to say, Look, where is this sound coming from? And so on and so forth. But these things appear to have just gone. Like what happened in Oweri some time ago, if you recall, the police facility damaged, government house nearby and all kinds of things, prison facility also damaged. From your study, what, what is the missing link in trying to connect this, the sister security agencies and getting them to act uh, in unison with regard to law enforcement? Thank you very much. Um, I think um, the story is still evolving and the issues that are raised uh, as such that until you know it is fully established, it will be difficult to know um, uh, which um, gunmen, um, those that escaped, and those that were trapped within. But of course, the information is that um, some were actually trapped inside because they went in the moment they used superior power to break the gate. Some went in to open all the cells within the prison, of course, to um, set free the inmates. And it was actually at that point that reinforcement came, um, of course, um, making it impossible for those that were already inside to escape. But the fact is that, like it is said, these gunmen came, you know, of course, in their numbers, in, in vehicles, and of course, at the point they got to the gate, they used whatever means to break the gate. Of course, it could be either um, um, explosive device, because knowing how the, the, the gate is, it's of course heavily fortified. But for them to have actually destroyed the gate and let loose um, the inmates, it actually means that they came with an explosive device. So those that were outside um, apparently you know, escape, I mean the, the, the attackers, but those that went in were actually trapped. But at the moment, we have not actually established the number, number of people or the number of gunmen that were trapped in the prison, and of course, those that eventually surrendered. Then, of course, um, uh, you know, coming to your question, um, it's actually still mind-boggling that just prison or just correctional you know, service center is one of the supposedly safest, you know, facilities around because by the side is the police headquarters. And of course, there is also um, um, another, um, I think, um, command just opposite the headquarters. And by the side, too, is the DSS you know, office. So it's actually mind-boggling that these attackers could come and succeed in breaking into, you know, the, the, the facility as the case may be. So um, the, the problem lies there with the lack of synergy that exists between these security agencies. I think um, an alarm mechanism or an alarm framework that is supposed to be set on ground to alert all these, you know, agencies surrounding the facility is lacking. And that is, 
one critical thing that I think um, um, security agencies should actually work towards um, addressing. Yeah, you are police, but I think that any security threat also affects your work. Yes, you are DSS, which is charged with the responsibility of basically gathering intelligence and, of course, um, um, issues relating to information that are critical to um, threats like that. Uh, and so I think that the synergy that is supposed to be seen to manifest in the work these agencies do is actually lacking. And, and that explains why these attackers were successful in breaking I into the facility. But, but thankfully, if not for the intervention of um, these forces, especially, I, I forgot to even mention the fact that some, some few yards you know, to the prison is the um, special tax force, which is Operation Safe Heaven. I think it's their own intervention that actually helped in addressing um, this. But majorly, um, like you said, there is no proper coordination and synergy between these security agencies to um, respond to emerging threats of this nature, you know, particularly with what happened in just correctional facility. And I think that sincerely, um, the audacity, like I said earlier, you know, these people must have planned this for a very long time. When you are entering the prison, um, the correctional facility, it's just one entry point, and there's no exit point. The only exit point is for you to either go to the prison barracks, you go to the police barracks, or you even go to the DSS uh, you know, office, which is also blocked. So it's just one entry point and one exit point. I'm very sure that even the inmates that, that escape must have lingered, littered around you know, the, the, the quarters of either the police or the prisons uh, for some time before they eventually um, escape. So, so there's a major lapse in the security agencies to coordinate their response to threats, especially of this nature. And it is all linked to the issue of the failure of intelligence. It could be that you know, intelligence may have been provided, but responding to this intelligence uh, promptly is also part of what makes um, the attack on the facility successful. Um, um, even though I would say that it's not fully successful because um, considering the capacity is just about 250, something that um, eventually escaped. But again, I think it's, it's um, uh, a pointer to the fact that our security agencies need to re-strategize and collaborate and synergize on how to respond to threats, whether they are, you know, um, uh, um, um, threats that have been there over time or threats that are spontaneous. Dr. Daske, thank you, thank you. And I, and I like the word you chose, audacity. It was the audacity of the attackers to have mm. gone into that area and, and gone out, you know, uh, uh, we, uh, I would say with little force of resistance. But again, we heard recent, uh, just this morning from the head of the Correctional uh, Center in Jaws that the identity of the attackers are cattle rustlers. And I'm wondering, how plausible is that? Are cattle being you know, reared in the prison yard, or what, what, what is it? Do you have any idea? possible that some wrestlers have been arrested and of course taken to the prison if it is true that um, the attackers are cattle wrestlers. It could be that some, some, some of their members have been arrested and of course taken to the prison and they must have gotten information that they are, you know, um, um, being of course um, housed in that facility and that could be the explanation you know, for that. But again, another information that we got is, um, like somebody mentioned, you know, issues of visiting, visitation, of course, is actually um, within the rights of the inmates to receive, you know, uh, visits from their relations. Um, but again, what is the extent to which um, those who come for visit are subjected to serious security scrutiny? before they are allowed in. 
Um, one of the narrations, which of course I've, I'm not very sure has been established, is the fact that um, some of them came in the name of visit, visiting. While you know they come in, they already had hidden weapons, you know, um, um, inside of the clothes they they were wearing, and of course, you know, that explains um, what happened. But, but I think that, like I said, since it is um, um, uh, it is being alleged that they are rustlers, they probably are coming in to free some of their members that may have been arrested and kept in the facility. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daskett. I, I, I just wonder, we're getting pressed for time now, but let me uh, still take advantage of our connection to uh, Karuna. Uh, uh, my Lord Honorable Justice uh, Bello, the point is one that uh, oftentimes hasn't been given sufficient consideration in my humble uh, submission, namely that prisons are on the exclusive legislative list and therefore a federal business. Hmm. But prisons accommodate persons who commit both federal and state offenses. And we have seen an increase in our population. We have also seen a rise in the number of offenses created by state legislatures and national legislatures. I don't know how many state prison facilities are there in the country, but wherever it is, if you commit an offense and then there is a custodial sentence, you go to a prison facility run by the federal government. Its own budget is limited. The other day at the National Assembly, I think there was some uproar about the feeding allowance from 750 Naira, they said it was 750 Naira, the question was, look, uh, can that feed any adult? Mm. Uh, why don't you take it up to 1,000? The time, uh, is it not ripe, uh, my lord, to say, look, let's take a look again at uh, our prisons. Shouldn't we have prisons on the concurrent list so that states can also build their own custodial centers and run them? Thank you so much, sir. Uh, for this question, uh, it's an advocacy which has been running for quite some time now. Uh, not only that, the need for the police force too to be on the concurrent uh, list so that states will have their own uh, police for the purpose of uh, state policy. Well, um, uh, one needn't have to go into history as to why the centralization, but just concisely to say uh, the experience of the 50s where the prisons and the police were being abused politically and uh, meaning that uh, opponents within the political balance were without justifiable cause sent to prisons and uh, sometimes to eternity, so to speak. And so with the police, that is native authority police, uh, and many other ills surrounding those institutions which led to the decision to centralize and control in terms of man, uh, damage control to the BRS minimally, if not eradicating in totality. But uh, with the turn of events now, as, uh, as uh, we are seeing and we are going through, uh, one may lend credence to what you have just said. And uh, uh, the earlier we have that, the better. Even as we know, we are likely to revert back to what was happening in the 50s uh, in terms of abuses, uh, politically motivated uh, arrest, politically motivated protracted detention, uh, uh, and uh, so forth and so on. But uh, with the enormity of uh, the challenges that we have now, it is very crucial that uh, that is done because when you have police that are coming from the immediate vicinity, they understand the terrain better. They can go into nooks and cranny, and they may know. If they may even know uh, those substantially, those that are around, and it may perhaps enhance uh, uh, checking of crimes uh, at the early stage to nip in the bud. So I would subscribe to that. Okay, thank you, uh, Justice Bello. Let me come back here and um, uh, put my question to. I'd like to start with Ruth Olofi, and and I'm looking at how we can make the correctional centers now uh, uh, less uh, attractive, for, for want of words, to attacks. And uh, earlier on, we've talked about the congestion. But I know that the issue of death penalty and 
you know, um, putting those on death row, you know, uh, applying the, that, that the law of death penalty on those on death row has been um, condemned or, you know, by rights groups and uh, most state governors also, state executive also, are uh, reluctant to put pen to paper on, 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 on that uh, part of, of the law, which is not uh, unconstitutional for us. So how do we, or what do we do to those inmates who are on the death row for over 10 to 20 years, for instance? All right, thank you so much. Um, my suggestion would be that we commit those on death row to life imprisonment. That would be my suggestion because- How does that become death sentence? Well, so if that you- <laughs> That is it. But if you look at it from a rights perspective, we come from the angle that you can't take human life, at least you can't take human, because you didn't create the person in the first place. We understand that, yes, these crimes will happen, capital offenses and all of that. But the, the actual deed of you know, signing off somebody's death is still a very contentious um, issue. And um, there are discussions that say that even the, for the governors, they see it as moral, you know, cultural, religious issues that they didn't create these persons and they cannot just sign it. And that is why you see that they are abdicating their duties back to the judiciary. I, I think that is to, one of the discussions that has not held really is to look at this angle um, in terms of non-custodial measures. We tend to, on our correctional uh, system, tend to be more punitive. You know, going there, you are punished and all of that. But how are we also looking at the other perspective around non-custodian? For instance, you want to do patrol. I mean, we watch American movies and we see that, you know, you have served uh, your term, you have maybe a year or so, you are, you, you're put on parole and a police officer or, or or an officer is, you know, putting your 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 care, and they are monitoring K that K process. Yes. If you're following that angle, tendency for me is that you're picking out the numbers, you know, gradually out of the prison system. Our our justice system has been so shaped in such a manner that the process has to be slow. Even with the, the very innovative laws that you've had around the Mission of Criminal Justice Act, you don't see that actively working in terms of speedy trials and all of that. But okay. back to the question that you asked, for me, I think I'll just leave it that death penalty should just be committed to life imprisonment. To life imprisonment, but Kingsley says <laughs> that how does that decongest the prisons? Because <laughs> we're talking about getting the prisons, you know, decongested. Well, until recently, we see that the prison is supposed to house just convicts. Uh, the, 20, um, the 2019 uh, Custodial Services yeah, Act, Act makes uh, part of what the mandate of the corrections is, is to, uh, to house pretrial detainees. Uh, so I'll look at it from the perspective or the mm. angle of the entry point. How do you get these persons? It's either they are convicted <coughs> or they are remanded by a court. So it's not just uh, the, the prisons that has, uh, the corrections that has a role to play in this, in, this, in, this, in this line. It's also the judiciary, the prosecuting agencies. So why don't we look at, instead of taking everybody yeah, who is suspected or charged for an offense, why don't, uh, instead of taking them to the to prison, the, to the, to the why status. don't we look at other diversionary uh, measures for instance, why don't the states, uh, the, the, the Honorable Justice Bello mentioned uh, b ab about what the state governments are not doing. This, an, this is an opportunity. If you don't have that mandate to, uh, you, these people are charged mostly under federal, uh, under state laws. So why don't you, for instance, and empower your, your, your state judiciary to do a kind of uh, pretrial system where not <coughs> everybody so when someone is charged for a minor offense, you don't take that person to the prisons. You have like a holding, um, a holding area mm -hmm. where that person waits and perfects his bail conditions 
and then he goes and then he comes back to uh, to, uh, to 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 to, to face his trial. His, his, his trial. <coughs> Instead of taking everybody to the custodial uh, to the custodial uh, uh, center, uh, right. and Ma also the overcriminalization of minor offenses. Okay. So everybody is charged, uh, and it goes down to the Char point of of the charging. Which is from the prosecuting agencies, mm -hmm. from the charging and and, oh, and okay, and Mahmoud, thank you. Uh, that's that's an issue. I don't know whether he has the data, uh, Doctor uh, Daskes in Jos. Tell us, do we have a sense of the percentage of rearrest of escapees from uh, prison facilities during a jailbreak or during an, an attack? This year we have had a fourth one. Last year, for instance. During the NSAS protest, 1,800 uh, prisoners escaped from the two prison facilities in Benin City. Do we have a sense of the numbers of rearrest, or those gentlemen are now on the loose? Yeah, I think that um, um, for you know jailbreaks that that took place in, in other other states, um, it's very difficult now to um, have a percentage of. Um, rearrested um, um, inmates, as the case may be. Um, and so the, the truth is that um, f for some of these um, jailbreaks, especially the ones that took place in, in Benin, you know, in, in Niger and other places, a significant number of the inmates, of course, were let loose. And we, the information we are getting is that not, not many of them were, were rearrested. But the situation in jails, of course, is, is slightly different because um, um, not, not um, uh, many of them I am escaped, but you actually discover that the arrest is not very significant, and that that sends a signal to the wider society to, of course, be more vigilant um, and be security conscious, knowing fully well that these people. He talked about um, recidivism; that it's an opportunity for them to go on rampage again. Um, Dr. Golen Daskes, criminologist and lecturer, Department of Sociology, University of Jokes. We really, really appreciate your contribution to Good Morning Nigeria today. Thank you very much. And let me also appreciate former Chief Judge of the FCT, Justice Ishak Bello, uh, who is also the Chairman, Presidential Committee on Corrections, Reforms, and Decongestion. Justice Bello, thank you very much, and do have a pleasant day. Uh, Ruth Olofi is Acting Executive Director, Clean Foundation. Always a pleasure to have you, Madam. Thank, Thank you very you much. So much and Mahmoud Yusuf, Legal Practitioner and Programs Manager, Network of University Legal Aid Institutions, New Life. Thank you very much for your perspective. Thank you for having me. And that's it. And good morning, Nigeria. But just before we go, let's quickly take a look at development in the sports world. <laughs>